Chapter 14, Overboard. A discussion followed among Nancy's friends whether they should let Dave lie still for a little while or carry him down to the cabin. The vote was for helping him down to the cabin. And let's start, Bess urged. Dave was gently turned on his back. Nancy kept track of his pulse while Bess took a scented handkerchief from her pocket and held it under his nostrils. A few minutes later, Dave opened his eyes and glanced around. He closed them again, but said, Something hit me on the back of the head. I have a terrible headache. Better stay where you are, George advised. She went toward the tiny mountain stream and dampened her handkerchief. Upon returning, she laid it on Dave's forehead. That feels good, he said. Breathing deeply, he added, And something smells mighty refreshing. Dave looked up once more. This time he tried to get up, but faltered. Take it easy there, Bert said, putting a hand under one shoulder. Dave was still a little groggy. He shook his head a few times and took several deep breaths. I'll be okay, he assured the others. But no more sleuthing tonight, Bess insisted. Not for any of us. It's just too dangerous in these woods, especially after dark. The others agreed, but said they would come back in the daylight and continue working on the mystery. I'd like to find the guy who socked me, Dave said. And I'd like to take care of him for you, Ned offered, his eyes flashing. It was a slow trek down the mountainside, but finally they reached the cabin and Dave went to bed at once. Aunt Eloise and Matt were very solicitous, and after checking Dave, concluded that he would not need a doctor. No one else felt sleepy. They all gathered in the living room to talk in subdued tones. The conversation returned to the mystery of the child's sunken coach. Nancy, let's see that valentine you told us about, Ned requested. She went for it and laid the memento carefully on the table. Matt and the boys admired the quaint cover with the name Maud Jason so cleverly worked into the scroll design. Then Nancy opened it and read the poem aloud. Ever faithful to thee, and the memory of the little lass, her lovely pony coach, lying neath the glimmer glass. N, backward C, E, 5, R. Nancy explained who R was, then asked, Any theories about that code? When no one answered, she went on. I'm sure that the poet must have been referring to Otsego Lake and perhaps to this mirror-clear bay. I'll bet you're right, George exclaimed. After studying the valentine, Ned suggested that the N and the E might well mean northeast. Nancy nodded as Bert asked, But what is that five under the backward letter C? She thought over the question a few moments, then replied, could stand for five-mile point across the lake. Nancy explained that the jut of land was about five miles distance from Cooperstown. Aunt Eloise spoke up. They tell a story about the point. The man who owned it at one time went off on a long trip. While he was away, the people of Cooperstown used it for a picnic and swimming area. When he returned, they all hoped that he would make it a public park. Instead, he chased everyone off the grounds and threatened arrest to the trespassers. The old meanie, George burst out. Bess asked what was located northeast from Five Mile Point. She speculated that the code might refer to some spot beyond the bay. Nancy produced a map of the area and drew a straight line from Five Mile Point directly northeast. She ended the line on the opposite side of the bay from Aunt Eloise's cottage. That's directly to the east of Glimmerglass Park, Bert pointed out. Let's go there early tomorrow morning, George proposed. Everyone agreed, and Nancy suggested they take tools with them, picks, rakes, and a crowbar. By morning, Dave was feeling like himself again and insisted upon going. Ned said he would like to try out the Crestwood and ask Nancy to sail to the search site with him. We'll go across the lake first, then back to the bay. 
She smiled. That would be fun, but we'll have to anchor a ways offshore. The water's rather shallow there for some distance out. The other young people would go in Ned's open sports car. Aunt Eloise had some errands in the village, and Matt offered to accompany her. He grinned. We may even take a long ride so Eloise can show me the sights. Nancy, George, and Bess were very much pleased about this new friendship. If we're not back by lunchtime, Nancy said, we'll picnic at Glimmerglass Park. By the way, will you stop at Miss Armitage's and give her the valentine? I think it will be safer there. I'll be glad to, her aunt replied. All the young people put on swimsuits and carried the scuba gear. The two couples went off in the car. Nancy and Ned hurried down to the dock and climbed aboard the Crestwood. Ned ran up the nylon sail, and Nancy took the tiller. It was a beautiful morning, but the water was so calm that there was barely enough breeze to gain headway. By tacking, Ned managed to move slowly into the middle of the lake. Only a few boats were out. One of them, a speedboat, was roaring toward them from the direction of Cooperstown. The pilot seemed to be making a beeline for the Crestwood. Didn't he see their sailboat? Or was he deliberately trying to harm the couple? Ned and Nancy maneuvered toward the west side of the lake. The oncoming speedboat veered in their direction. He's crazy, Ned exclaimed. Get ready to dive, Nancy. Just as the motorboat neared them, the pilot, who was alone, turned the wheel sharply, causing great waves that rocked the sailboat violently. He steered on, within seconds swerved back. This time he passed the Crestwood on the other side at such speed that towering swells formed. Nancy and Ned were working furiously to keep their craft from capsizing. Nancy got a quick look at the name of their tormentor's boat. The Water Witch! She had no time to speculate about the man's identity. Was he an accomplice of the girl who had tried to run over Bess in the same craft? That guy's a fiend, Ned cried out. The pilot made another sweeping circle around the Crestwood. This time the waves were too powerful for the sailboat to withstand. It capsized, throwing Nancy and Ned into the water. Instantly the motorboat took off, roaring back toward Cooperstown. After their plunge, the couple clung to their overturned craft. He's wicked, Nancy cried angrily. In a few moments, she and Ned began trying to right the Crestwood. Though the sail was made of a light nylon fabric, it was heavy enough to hamper their efforts. Nancy swam around to the fallen mast and strained to lift the sail while Ned tugged at the other side of the boat. It was no use. I'll have to haul in the sheet, he said. Fortunately, their friends, already in the water, had seen the accident in the distance. They had also noticed someone coming into the bay from the head of the lake. Yo was piloting his little outboard. We need a ride, George shouted at him as he approached. Two of you climb aboard, he said. Then he noticed the overturned craft. Who's that out on the lake? When he heard the names, Nancy and Ned, he revved to full speed the instant George and Bert were in his boat. Within minutes, the crestwood was righted and the sheet hoisted. It will dry quickly, Nancy thought. Water, which still remained in the sailboat, was bailed out. Yo asked, what made you go over? Nancy told him and added, by the way, did you find out who owns the water witch? Yes, but they've rented it to a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Welch. Sorry, but I forgot the man's first name. Was it Samuel or Michael by any chance? Nancy asked. Yo's face lighted up. How'd you know that? It was Michael. Nancy was delighted with the information. Now she had a very good lead to the enemies who were harassing her and her friends. I'll make further inquiries at that dock next time we go to Cooperstown, she determined. Nancy and Ned sailed to the area where they wanted to search while Yo took Bert and George back there. He waved goodbye and chugged off. There were many sunbathers on the public beach of Glimmerglass Park 
and picnickers at tables. Nancy thought her group was far enough away not to be noticed, but she was wrong. Within a short time, they were besieged by the questions of curious onlookers, some on foot, others in small boats. One precocious boy in a canoe called out with a smirk, What you hunting for? A sunken treasure? End of chapter 14